Hi everyone, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I think I see a lot of faces that I recognize, so um, we're going to sort of take tonight as uh, a briefing, right? So it's not going to be a deep dive into what is the Living Building Challenge. We figure if you're here, you probably have some general idea of Living Building Challenge, how it applies. Uh, so we're going to talk about, more importantly, the changes going from standard 3.1 to 4.0. Uh, likewise, uh, you know, we are going to talk about some of the new programs. Um, so that's kind of how tonight's format's going to be organized. As far as questions go, if you've got deep burning questions that can't wait until the end, please feel free to shout out or stop me or throw something at any point in time. Uh, however, we've got a lot to go through. So um, if you can hold it to the end or, or maybe wait and get us outside in the, in the reception, we'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, so before I get started, does anyone have anything they want to throw out now? Okay, great. So Living Future Collaborative welcomes you to Living Building Challenge 4.0. Uh, so everyone's familiar with this, Living Building Challenge, it's a pathway to a regenerative future and again the whole question of what does good look like. Um, this is some of just the standard legal language, so we'll skip past that. The idea being, you know, imagining what a world can look like if all of our infrastructure and ecosystems were employing place-based solutions. Uh, so again, this is a little bit of a background on what the Living Building Challenge and their current ideology has gone through. It's a feedback loop and we continue to change, which has led us here to 4.0. So <clears throat> this is the big change and I'll just start talking about this. Uh, as, a, as a kind of a briefing slide, and then we'll go into all the imperatives. So what this is, is uh, we've got the change from 3.1 to 4.0, um, ecology of place. So everybody remembers what ecology of place is. Uh, this includes a performance-based approach to the project location. And what they mean by performance-based, I'll get into when I get to that slide. But remember, these are some of the changes uh, that are trying to make LBC 4.0 easier, honestly, and don't think that means easier to attain, i.e. Um, lacking in standards. More importantly, it's realizing that some of the things that were done in some of the earlier versions of the standard maybe didn't advance the advocacy and market changing direction as much. It was a little bit in, a, in a, maybe a non-productive direction, so they've reviewed this, gone through that feedback loop, worked with all the design teams, worked with all the project teams, and they've now tried to make it to where everything in the standard is all pushing in the same direction. So that's this idea of <clears throat> the, uh, the, the performance-based approach. A lot of what you're going to see in the imperatives, and I'll refer to it later, is a new part of the ILFI programs, which is the core. And so what they've done is they've taken some of the imperatives and broken them out into two or possibly three different imperatives that were once before a single one. And what that does is, is they're going to then take those 10 that have been taken out and turn that into what is now the core standard, which we'll talk about later, but is kind of between lead platinum and living building. So it fills this gap in here. Does that make sense? Everybody good? Okay. Urban agriculture, we all know what that is. It used to be based on the floor to area ratio. There was a percentage you had to hit. Now they've changed it to where it makes sense and there's abilities to now have built-in uh, flexibility based on performance base or how it applies and really gets the point across. Particularly in transects four through six in the more dense urban areas, it was really difficult to meet some of those FARs and how that was working out. So we weren't really meeting that goal. The water pedal has been divided into two imperatives, one which then applies to the core uh, program and one which then applies to the full living building or pedal certification program. The energy pedal, the same thing, and you're going to start to see sort of a similarity in uh, mindset or, or format of what they've done with some of these imperatives where they've broken them out. Uh, the healthy interior environment, healthy interior performance, same idea, breaking them out into that. Access to nature, responsible materials. Red List has just gone through a little bit of a, a rework, and when it comes to the materials pedal, I'm going to skip over those fairly quickly because Kim is going to address the whole sort of materials responsible sourcing and discussion uh, when he gets to his part of the talk. Uh, inclusion and, uh, and as far as diversity and the equity pedal, they've changed a little bit of that. The biophilic design has been also broken out to where part of that is part of core, and then the education and inspiration. So, 3.1 to 4.0, 90% of the effort put towards 10% of the impact 
that's why I said they kind of realized that there was a lot of work for a little bit of impact. They changed it to where 90% of the effort goes to 90% of the impact. So it makes a whole lot more sense. They've aligned the goals versus just going by the letter of the standard. And again, like I said, core kind of falls in the middle there. So some of the just standard slides everybody seen, what does good look like? Advocacy, you know, again, this is, this is why we're all here. This is what we all believe in. So, so it's just what does good look like? Again, the, the whole classic slide that we've all seen, uh, some people that have seen some of Joshua's talks that were in here last year, um, so crappy it's illegal, all the way up to really good. Uh, but we stuck with, we stuck with the out of the box slides. Um, so here we go. Uh, some of the, the types of projects that can be included, new construction, existing buildings, interior projects, and then also at the end of this, I'll talk about the living community challenge as well. So the typologies, everybody's relatively familiar with the typologies. You have new buildings, you have existing buildings, you have interiors, and you have landscape or infrastructure projects. Okay, so that stays the same. Scale jumping, again, I'm trying to kind of hit topics very quickly here so as we get into the imperatives and nobody's lost, everybody's a, 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 everybody remembers what scale jumping is. It's where you can take uh, multiple projects and make them all take advantage of the same imperative. So these are the ones that have the scale jumping as part of it. So the transects, again, L1 through 3, or L1 and 2, very rural, L3, more of a college campus type setting, L4 through 6, dense urban environments increasing in density. And that they've now taken and they use these to, to again, kind of realize uh, more applicable pro uh, processes in the various um, imperatives. So again, this is all the projects sort of in one glance, the zero carbon, the, ze the, the net zero, the core program, the pedal, and the living building certification. This is not including um, the Living Community Challenge or some of the other programs. So, to the place-based, uh, or to the place imperative. So, the ecology of place. Now, the way that this has changed is you see here where it talks about um, all projects must demonstrate that they contribute positively to the ecology of their place and restore or enhance the ecological performance of the site towards a healthy ecological baseline. So they're starting to actually apply some metrics and measurement to these to, to let them have more of an impact. Urban agriculture. So you've got the standard old way on the right, or on the left rather, the pathway one, which is agriculture only, and that's based on your transect and your floor to area ratios as to how much of your total site needs to be devoted to food production. Whereas on the right then, pathway two says, okay, you've actually, maybe you don't have to do that because it's a little bit less uh, available for some, in some areas, particularly in the, the transect six, but you have to provide access to food trucks or a CSA, or you have to provide the ability for fresh, organic, healthy produce to be brought on site in a way. So you're providing part of your site to, to give access to that. Does that make sense? Okay. Habitat exchange really hasn't changed much. This is really just a way of offsetting, you know, we're, anytime you build anything, you're doing something to disrupt someone's or some entity's habitat. This is a habitat exchange for setting that aside. Again, if there's any questions or if anybody's not, doesn't remember imperatives or, or, or has questions about them, uh, you know, bring it at the end or if you need to jump in, please do. I feel like I'm going very fast, that's why I say. So, human scale living. Now you're going to see, and I should have referred to it back at the, at the first two, um, you're going to see when they say the core imperatives, there's 10 out of the 20 imperatives that apply to the core program that I've talked about. So you'll see that up there. So, this is really about, you know, making human scale living, you know, providing walkable areas. Um, you know, it talks about um, places for people to gather and connect. Uh, you need to provide at least two uh, electric vehicle charging stations or, depending on if you have a larger area, you need to provide one for every 30 spaces. So uh, it's, it's different things like that, talking about reducing impervious surfacing. Again, it's just as a concept, really, this is about we're in buildings all the time. You know, we get up in our buildings at home and then we have a little brief interlude with nature when we go from our, you know, box to our car and then we're in our car that's our box. And so this is just trying to reestablish our connection with nature. That's what the whole thing's about. 
So again, a continuation of the human scale of living, talking about carpooling or providing access to that. One of the, you, know, you need to implement at least four of the following strategies, and there's a whole list. I encourage everybody to go and you know, download the standard and take a look. Water. So water used to be one imperative, and now it's two in order to try and get the core program to where it's attainable, but again, not at the level of doing the living building. So first is responsible water use. And like I said, you're going to start to see a format similarity between multiples of these. So to summarize the responsible water use, we're treating water as a depreciable resource. We're trying to reduce the use. We're going to compare it against a baseline, and we're trying to reduce the use compared against um, an existing or a new building that's of a more conventional approach. Does that make sense? Okay, then you have net positive water, and this is really what the old imperative primarily was, which was you treat everything on site, you don't let anything leave, you handle all your water needs on an annual basis based on the water that's on site. Understand the difference in the two, one is a reduction, one is the old aggressive standard that's more for a living building. You still have to meet all of them if you're in going for full certification. Okay. Energy. It's really the same thing. The first one is a core imperative. This is reduction. This is looking at the standard way it's done and then looking at the living building way it's done and it's reducing your consumption. It's looking at energy conservation measures. It's looking at ways to bring that use down. That's this imperative. And then, as we've seen it before, now net positive carbon, so it's no longer net positive energy. So they've taken some of the energy and moved it into the previous imperative. And now you have net positive carbon, which is great looking at really kind of what our overall goal is, which is carbon reduction, carbon neutrality. And so now they're putting that into this. You're, you still have to supply 105% of your energy needs on an annual basis. But now there's also some carbon reduction uh, language in here as well. Uh, all projects must account for the total embodied carbon emissions from its construction, those sorts of things. So it starts to get into uh, being more um, advocacy based on this one and then being more reduction based on the previous one. Again, start to see this same format. Health and happiness, again, much like it was before, you comply with ASHRAE 62, you're going to provide access to natural ventilation, daylight and views. You're making an interior environment that everyone would want to be in. Interior performance. So it's a little bit different. Now this is the one that's measured. So again, the first one was part of the core program, a little bit easier to achieve. This one is more performance-based, a little bit more difficult to achieve. Now you're starting to talk about, you know, providing ongoing air quality tests and really measuring and documenting all of this information that goes into the interior environment. Does that make sense? We're good? Access to nature. They really couldn't make this one any more straightforward access to nature, give everybody right to light, give everybody right to, to experience nature and be in it, right? And so the, the third paragraph there, all projects must request that occupants complete a post-occupancy evaluation that addresses the health benefits of the project. That's, again, that's it, right? It's, it's, it's measuring and documenting and seeing that these things really do impact the occupants the way that we're looking for. Materials. I'm going to go through these fairly fast. Just know that these are the imperatives. Kim's going to cover them when he gets into the, the other products. But we've got responsible materials, which is part of the core program. This starts to talk a little bit about the, the DECLARE program and the things that are involved and how much of different uh, components are involved in the project. The red list, we've all seen it. I think we've actually added more than the 777 chemicals that were part of 3.1. Responsible sourcing, this is starting to talk about the declare labels, material transparency, and just, you know, uh, that sort of um, approach to, to documentation. Living economy sources, this is living economy sourcing, this is more about um, the proximity to the site and, and that sort of incremental, as things get heavier, they get closer, and that sort of thought of, of reducing overall carbon uh, by gaining your materials closer to the site. Net positive waste, 
just like what it said. It's not part of the core program, but this is a very aggressive uh, part of the materials pedal and, and the living building challenge is from the very, very outset of a project, you're looking at how you can completely repurpose and have a zero waste project. So however that's cradle to cradle or life cycle use or reintegration or whatever it is, that's the net positive waste imperative. Equity. We've all got to live in this little world together. So universal access is part of the core program. And this is really access to the projects, to not blocking uh, other people's access to what would be um, valuable resources, but in a non-conventional definition of a valuable resource, such as light, um, waterways, views, uh, these things that, that take on a little bit more of a social justice perspective, but you can imagine in sort of an old, outmoded way of thinking that if there's a beautiful shoreline where people have enjoyed walking along it for, for years, decades, and then a developer or, or a city or whatever comes in and develops along it and actually blocks access to that, that's taking away what at one time was a right. So that's sort of the idea behind universal access and some of the other things. Uh, again, going on natural waterways, sunlight. Don't build a building that blocks sunlight onto someone else's site. That's pretty straightforward. Inclusion. This really gets into the JUST program, which Kim is going to talk about in a few minutes. Uh, this is uh, talking about you know, um, transparency in more of the social way, in more of the, the corporate and more um, interaction personnel uh, transparency and, and truth. Beauty. Beauty and biophilia, one of my favorites. Uh, so the core imperative requires that you look at how that human nature continuum is influenced by this time that we spend in these boxes and these buildings so that we get that time with nature. It, it documents how it affects us. We have to conduct a biophilic workshop at the outset of a project to look at how we can employ different strategies. Not every project is going to be easy to achieve, you know, putting the building in a garden. But you have to look at some way and all the different things that biophilia covers our connection to nature and find ways to integrate that into the project. Does that make sense? Okay. Education and, education and inspiration. Again, this is what we've seen for a long time. It's the idea of taking what we've learned, taking what the whole team that goes through the project goes through and then sharing it with the world that didn't go through it and explaining to them how they benefit from it, explaining how it benefits the occupants, explaining how it benefits the owners, explaining how it benefits the community around that didn't even have a part to do with the project. But it's that education and inspiration component. And the inspiration is important because that's then what's going to lead to everybody around you doing the right thing. Right? Good. Okay. And again, it's also part of the core program. So that was Living Building Challenge 4.0 from a fire hose. <laughs> um, so I apologize, but like I said, we've got a lot to get through because what we're also going to take and, and share with you tonight is not only what changed from 3.1 to 4.0, but is also the other programs that ILFI has to offer that some of you may not have heard of before. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time. So I'm just going to jump through these. Again, the core certification program. This is brand new, it was released less than two months ago, so it is just off the ground. I don't think there are any core projects yet. Uh, maybe there's one or two that might be considering it. But again, it's time to practice the best green building standard that's out there. So this is sort of a, a brief overview of the core program. Those 10 out of the 20 shows the ones that, that um, scale jumping uh, is allowed on. Uh, as well as the responsible water use. And I didn't touch on hand printing, but I'll just briefly touch on it. Does anybody in the audience know what hand printing is? Okay, everybody knows what footprinting is, right? We all know what our carbon footprint, our energy footprint, it's that negative or, or at least that, that impact that we have, right? So it's, it, you can imagine as though a footprint is in a way taking away. It's, it's our footprint. It's, it's what we're, we're doing that's maybe negative. Hand printing is the idea of 
restoring that. It's the idea of going back in and doing things proactively that take action and take energy that put back what we've destroyed by our footprint. Does that make sense? And that's kind of like a, a very, very, very thin definition of it, but that's the idea. Footprinting is what you leave. Handprinting is what you do to remediate. And again, this chart just shows how, what things different apply in the, in the three typologies. So the Living Community Challenge. In many ways, the Living Community Challenge follows in the exact same format and many of the same imperatives are named the same as they are in 3.1 for the Living Building Challenge because really the same ideas apply. So it's about looking at teams in a broader sense. It's basically taking the Living Building Challenge and expanding it to a community. So you see limits to growth, urban agriculture, habitat exchange, human powered living, net positive water, net positive energy, civilized environment, very similar. Healthy neighborhood design. Now that's a little bit different, but it's again, I think the, the title of it tells you what it's about. Biophilic environment, taking what you did for the building, expanding it to your community. Resilient community connections. This is a little bit more about the connections between everyone in and, and it feeds into the, the whole plan. The living materials plan, again, it's the idea of looking at on a community scale how you source and use materials. The embodied carbon footprint, I think we've all got that. It's when you look at the whole community, it's how much embodied carbon is in the overall project and there's ways to mitigate that. The net positive waste, again, following the same idea. Human scale and humane places, universal access to nature and place, we've already talked about that. The universal access to community services. You wouldn't have that so much at a living building scale, but at a community scale, you need for everyone to have access to the same community services. And that's actually one of the things when we talk about sort of the, the, um, the qualifications to be able to apply for a living community project, you have to then have diversity of function. Equitable investment, that's really again about, you know, you're investing in the equity and diversity and inclusion of the community. Just organizations, that means that different members and different groups within the Living Community Challenge Project have to be registered as a just organization. Beauty and spirit and inspiration and education, again, pretty straightforward on that. So this is just sort of a call to action, you know, seven billion people and counting, we've really got to do something different. So the Living Community Challenge has three different ways of achieving it. You have full Living Community Certification, you have the pedal Certification, which you have for the, for the building level as well, and then you have the Zero Energy Community Certification, and that is an idea of all of the energy use in the community is zero energy, it's, it's net over an annual year, and no combustion involved. And that's usually where people start to have a sharp intake of breath when they get their mechanical and electrical engineers involved. Um, but the idea of zero combustion is definitely part of it. So again, that's really it um, about the, the Living Community Challenge. It's a matter of you know, going in and realizing that when you apply for a Living Community Challenge, you first have to go through, I may have the visionary step in here. I apologize. I do have a couple more. Uh, this talks about sort of the process. Um, once a project reaches the scale and diversity of a community, it may register for the Living Community Challenge. Uh, diversity of uses, that's what I was talking about, where you have access to the essential components of livability. You need places to sleep, eat, work, eat, worship, meditate, whatever. All those community functions need to be part of the projects that make up the overall uh, group that's going for living community certification. Does that make sense? You wouldn't want to take like a series of row houses and that wouldn't be a community by itself because it's not serving multiple functions. Does that make sense? Very good. Okay. Uh, this is sort of, no, I'll back up one. So this is sort of the, the process to go through. You register the project, you make sure it meets all these. Now again, they talk here, so diversity of use, multiple buildings, i.e. it has to be more than one building, and at least one multi multimodal street. So you're looking at different ways of transportation. If you don't meet those three and you only meet number four, which is the shared infrastructure, then you really are just at a living building level. But if you meet the other three, then you go for living community challenge. And then the second step, which is optional, is this living community vision plan. And that's part of step two. 
Living Community Vision Plan looks at sort of what the overall vision could be and is sort of a, a, an inspirational and an aspirational step. But you do have to do the community master plan. This could take a long time, right? Up to three years you've got to register it and go through and potentially hit that master plan level. Assuming you make it through the three years and then you're ready to go to the next step, you continue on into the, the emerging living community. And this is when you actually have some of the projects started on some of the buildings that are going to be part of the overall living community project and they've started. So now you've got a plan in place and you've actually started to do something on one of the project sites. Now it's an emerging living community project. And then finally, you get all the buildings that are part of the project together, long time, potentially, or if you've, you know, if everyone pat and pitches in and has the funds, it could occur more quickly. And then you have a full living community certification. Again, I didn't, I didn't mention it because we wanted to kind of cover, but to reiterate, everything about the living building and living community challenges based on actual measured performance after 12 full months of occupancy and use. And I say occupancy and use because it's really about not only testing the way that the engineers and the architects and the designers all put the building together or the community together, it's also about how the occupants that are in that space have used it and the systems that were designed have functioned correctly and the occupants in the spaces have used it correctly because the designers may have done all their work correctly but if the users push the buttons and flip the switches the wrong way and open the windows or close the windows or do other things, then it's back to the education component and getting them to use the tool, the building, the, the, the system the right way, right? So once you've met 12 months and it's performed correctly and all of the measurement and metering and verification is done, then you can apply for full certification. Does that make sense? Have I got questions with that? Yes, sir. Does every building in a living, build, living community challenge project need to be living building certified? No. What they say is it's a majority. Um, where's the word here? Because um, it was actually on that slide. Was it on that slide? Okay. Well, then there we go. So you tripped me up. But basically, no. You don't. Not everyone. It's a majority of the buildings that are part of the project need to meet living building certification. So. Moving beyond that, that's really it. Um, two rules. All imperatives are mandatory and certification is based on actual rather than modeled or anticipated performance. That's it. Any questions? Okay. Yes? Certified, I don't think so. Do you know of one? I don't think. There, there's, there's a few that are underway, but again, because it is such an aspirational goal, they're still all in the planning phase. Let me flip Kim over here. Where are they? I would have to look it up. I'm not entirely certain. Unless Kim knows. I know. Not all. Oh, that's, that's my bad. Hold on, I did that. Let me get, let me get that. Uh, let's do that, and there you go. All right. So what Paul was talking about were the building products of... Um, oh, yeah. sorry about that. We need to switch over mics. Um, so what Paul was talking about were the, the building uh, living future products, so things like the full living building challenge, the uh, living pedals, uh, the core certification, zero energy, zero carbon. So that, that was the building family of products. What I'm going to be talking about <clears throat> is everything else. And the first of those is the JUST program. So JUST is a, a way for, it, it's a framework for organizations to demonstrate their commitment to social justice. So it's not really a certification program, it's a disclosure program. And there are many different uh, indicators that are included in the program, but it's, it's about being transparent and disclosing how your organization has made a commitment, and once again, performance-based, what you're doing 
from a social justice standpoint. So that's the tagline. It's time to make social justice your business. That, that it's not just about making a profit. It's about making a impact on the people who work for you and work with you and the communities that you work in from a social standpoint. So there's uh, a number of different things that, that go into the JUST program where we're talking about elevating that discussion around those social justice issues. We're creating that common language uh, for social justice issues. We're talking about them and elevating those causes. Uh, we want to change the, the practices and policies of organizations so that they're really performing from a social justice standpoint and to make life better for people from all walks of life. So the JUST program has sort of gone through its, its first generation. So JUST 1.0 um, uh, is, is still taking registrations, but at uh, Living Future, they unveiled JUST 2.0 and what's different? Well, there's several new indicators. Some of the indicators have, have basically morphed. Uh, some of the categories have been rearranged, but it's, uh, an, uh, uh, once again, making the effort that you do to do the disclosure really have an impact on what's going on with your uh, your organization. Um, there used to be a registration fee for organizations that wanted to start into the JUST program. Um, now it's you just become a premium member of the International Living Future Institute and a premium membership is $150 a year so it's not a, a huge um, barrier for entry and it used to be that you could opt out of disclosing up to three of the indicators, um, but no more than one in any of the categories. Now you can actually opt out of any of the indicators, one in each category. So up to six you can opt out of. Now, the, the way it works is there are levels of achievement. So in each one of the indicators, there's uh, a, a one, two, three, four star uh, level of achievement. You can be a, a just organization and not actually achieve any of those levels of performance just disclosing where you are on those indicators is enough to make you part of the just organization labeling. So that, that gives you an idea that it's not a certification prod, prod, prod program, it's a disclosure and transparency program. Uh, TLC uh, is, is a just organization. We, uh, participated in the 1.0. We've actually gone through a recertification under 1.0. Um, and I would say that for TLC, it was a really interesting exercise to go through this transparency and disclosure process because it made us look at things that we hadn't looked at. Uh, within our organization before. And, and some of those things, we weren't even achieving the minimum threshold ad. But by the time it came around for our recertification two years after the first uh, round, we were uh, doing better in those things to the point where we were achieving a couple of stars in, in indicators that we hadn't even gotten a star in before. So it's, it's, as the first slide showed, it was a way for us to elevate the discussion about these social justice issues and to actually begin to achieve some better practices, some best practices in social justice. Um, and it bears repeating that uh, under the building programs, just organizations are part of the imperatives associated with being living building uh, 
core and full certification projects. So let's talk now about materials. There's also a family of products uh, that the Living Future Institute uh, engages in that looks at the environmental impact of material choices that we make in the built environment. So the, the core certification, as we talked about before, is a lower level of, of participation while the living building, the, the greater participation, engages in more of that. So you're looking at living product challenge products that go into uh, a, a core and living building project. Um, declare labeled products. I'll talk about living product challenge and declare in just a second. Wood products being uh, for stewardship council uh, certified and then materials coming from within uh, a reasonably local uh, radius of the project. So you can see that there's a couple of tiers here, the core being sort of the entry level and then living challenge being the greater level of compliance. Um, as Paul indicated, the red list is something that's really gaining a lot of traction uh, in, in our community, in the design and construction community. We're finding more and more materials that are finding their ways into our built environment that are toxic to the people who occupy that environment, toxic to the people who manufacture the materials to get them into our environment, and then toxic when we take them out of our buildings and go back into the environment. So, uh, there's a lot more uh, materials finding their way into the red list, but because the Living Building Challenge is wanting to, once again, put that 90% of effort into 90% of effect, there's been sort of a pullback from no red list in your projects at all to a reasonable threshold. 90% of the, the project uh, materials by cost must avoid the red list instead of zero red list at all. So that's, that's a real, has been a real barrier for a lot of teams uh, to achieve living building uh, challenge certification. So that's, that's a, a big one that I think is going to really uh, I'll lower the barrier to get a lot more projects involved in LBC, but it's not a big compromise on the red list imperative. We're also now talking more about embodied carbon. As, as, we talk, as Paul talked about in the materials uh, and net carbon uh, positive, we're not only looking at the energy that the building, the carbon associated with the energy that the building needs to operate, but the carbon that was embodied in the building to build it in the first place. The energy uh, incurred by getting the materials to the site, actually the energy used by the contractor in building it, and then the energy that's embodied in the building itself. Now this is, this is a really interesting slide that's got a lot of stuff on it. So I want to go through this in just a little bit of detail. So what we're looking at here is, this is today, building related greenhouse gas emissions. If we don't do anything at all about the way we do business today, we're looking at a six degree temperature rise by the year 2030. If we continue along that growth pattern, we're looking at another um, six degrees to uh, uh, 2050, not 2030, six degrees uh, worldwide. If we look at the trend that we're on, which is to actually um, reduce the energy use intensity of our buildings, we're looking at a four degree rise. The IPCC has told us if we do two degrees, we stand a chance of surviving uh, the hotter planet. So we're already at four degrees on the trend that we're on now. 
there's four different things that we need to do to get down to the two degrees that the IPCC tells us that we need to maintain. And those include making near zero energy buildings, doing deep renovations on our existing buildings, lowering the carbon intensity of the energy supply that we have today, and then going to the low greenhouse gas materials. So just reducing the energy use of our buildings and just having a green grid is not gonna get us there. We're gonna have to start looking at reducing the embodied carbon of the materials that we use in our buildings. So once again, the core uh, certification is sort of the entry level. What we're looking for is a 20% reduction uh, as opposed to the sort of business as usual baseline. And then for the living challenge, we're just going to go ahead and document what that carbon intensity is of all the building's materials. Um, the, the product certifications that, that we're seeing now in um, the building industry include something called cradle to cradle, and then the material health or the mindful materials listings, and then the two living future products, the living product challenge and the declare uh, label. So the living product challenge is a multi-attribute certification for products where the DECLARE label is much more focused on the health impacts of that material. So you can think of DECLARE as being sort of a subset of the living product challenge. There are many more DECLARE products than there are living products so far because of that greater amount of disclosure and, and transparency and performance associated with things like the energy used to produce them. So it's time for uh, an advertisement now. Coming to Nashville in October is going to be the Living Product Expo. So at Music City Center, uh, the 8th through the 10th of October, the living building community, the worldwide living building, living future community is coming to Nashville. Um, they're going to spend three days with us, uh, enjoying Music City and, and really doing a deep dive into things like the Living Product Challenge and the Declare Label. Um, on Tuesday, October the 8th, from 8 o'clock in the morning till noon, there's going to be a Living Building Challenge 4.0 workshop. So here's a half day of deep dive, intensive, here's what it takes to conform to the Living Building Challenge 4.0 standard. I want to encourage anybody who has any interest in learning more, being uh, uh, Living Future accredited, uh, getting involved in Living Building Challenge projects, this is a great opportunity for you to really be immersed into uh, what it takes to be uh, a living building. Um, we're, we've got some folks here in the audience today that are, are helping the folks with the Living Future Institute uh, put together some social events. This is gonna be a very fun uh, uh, opportunity for all our Living Future colleagues from all over the world to come to see us here in Nashville. We're gonna show them a good time while they're here and hopefully learn a lot from them. Um, also, uh, a companion uh, organization, the U.S. Green Building Council folks, um, have released a new version of LEED. Uh, LEED version 4.1 is actually in its beta format. This has taken a number of the credits that are in LEED version 4 and evolved them in the same way that we've been talking about the Living Building Challenge, is talking more about not making them easier, but making them easier to document, making it easier for project teams to actually apply 
what the, the new credits were trying to do in version four. And a big part of that is material transparency. A lot of projects are being scared off of lead version four because of the materials credits and how they were changed in version four. Version 4.1 really makes that transition much, much user friendly than it used to be. So um, as uh, later this month on June the 25th, uh, from two to five o'clock at Hastings new uh, place over on Polk, uh, there's gonna be a, a three hour workshop on lead version 4.1. If you're a USGBC me organization member, it's $75 ahead, $95 for people who are not USGBC members. Um, the tickets are on Eventbrite. I urge you, uh, once again, this is an opportunity for you to really uh, learn what's in version 4.1, get exposed to it by people from the USGBC. Uh, the head of di uh, technical direction is going to be conducting uh, that workshop. So please uh, make some time on the 25th of June to go through the version 4.1 workshop. So. You've drunk from the fire hose. It's time for us to go out into the lobby, have some refreshments, talk about uh, what you might have, any questions that you might have, uh, do some fellowship, and then look forward to seeing you again at the next Living Future Collaborative meeting. Thanks very much. Let's go.